from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, a glimpse into the future of entertainment. Netflix versus Disney. House of Dragons versus Lord of the Rings. And all of it versus TikTok. Who wins and loses? I'll speak with former TikTok CEO and top former Disney executive, Kevin Meyer. Plus, learning in the metaverse. Our ad tech series continues with a candid conversation about the future of virtual learning and whether it could tip the balance in favor of screen time. And lawyers for Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes failed in a long shot attempt to get her fraud conviction thrown out. We're going to hear from our own Jill Rosenblatt, who was in the courtroom for this decision. We will get to all of that in a moment. Stocks ending another week down on the back of a jobs report that showed people are going back to work. But that means the Fed will likely stay on its hawkish course. Bloomberg's Shanali Basik. Here to break it all down, hey Shanali, happy Friday. Happy Friday, Emily. If we take a look, not so happy of a Friday for the stock market. You have the S&P down more than 1%, as you say, on the back of that expectation of a hawkish Fed. But remember, it did try to scrape higher into the day, ending the day lower. Then you do have the NASDAQ 100 ending more than 1.4% lower on the day, so a steeper decline than you're seeing in the S&P 500. Both of these indices are down on the week pretty significantly. And then you have the two-year yield. Interestingly, you had that really rise very significantly into the week, getting well above that 350 level, really pairing some of those uh, rises that you saw in the two-year yields. And remember, those yields have a big impact on what you're going to expect on how you value a lot of these high-growth companies moving forward. And Bitcoin, Bitcoin is back below 20,000. You are now at 19,959. We are watching that very closely. It hasn't broken too far below these levels here. But again, Bitcoin trades into the weekend. If we flip up the board here, let's look at another asset lately very correlated to Bitcoin. That is that NASDAQ 100, as I've been talking to you about. The five-day move here, when I said significant, what I meant was a 4% drop this week. That's not the biggest drop that we've seen. But again, moving into September, which is a traditionally hard month for stocks, it'll be interesting to see how this trades into next week. We did see traders try to get back some of those gains, but again, ending the day and the week much lower. A couple individual movers for you quickly here, Emily. I want to take a look here at Starbucks because remember they had that new CEO announcement. On the back of that, the stock has declined 2.8% on the day, 2.9%. That is, of course, deeper than we saw in the S&P. Lululemon was your biggest gainer here in that NASDAQ 100 that was down on the day, 6.7% higher on the back of encouraging earnings. People are buying leggings. Broadcom, we have also 1.7% higher on the day, shaking off a lot of those fears for those chip companies, Emily. All right, we're going to dig into chips a little later in the show. Shanali Bostic, thank you for that update. Meantime, turning to streaming, Netflix is set to launch its ad-supported service later this year. A significant premium at a significant premium compared to other streaming platforms, as far as we know. The streaming giant intending to roll out this plan ahead of its rival Disney+, Plus, which will launch its own ad-supported plan on December 8th. Netflix hasn't announced the rate for its ad-supported plan yet. We're going to break all of this down with Kevin Meyer, founder and co-CEO of Candle Media, a former top longtime Disney executive, of course, as well. Kevin, it's so great to have you back here on the show. So curious what you think of this raft of streaming news we've gotten over the last several weeks, and especially this, these ad-supported tiers. How much do you think these will really drive new subscribers to Netflix and Disney Plus? Well, great to be here, Emily. Always enjoy being on your show. Um, look, I think there's a lot of promise in these ad-supported tiers. I do think that there are very substantial tailwinds in the marketplace, and marketers are looking to place their brand marketing dollars in high-quality video environments. Uh, linear television has been the traditional uh, place where they spend that money, and of course, that has becoming that's becoming challenged from just an audience perspective, as audiences move from linear television and pay TV over to streaming. That's what streaming is where the audiences are. Uh, when I launched Disney Plus a couple, you know, several years ago, uh, we had marketers you know, trying to bang down our doors to have advertising on Disney Plus. So I know there'll be an explosion of demand. I also know, having uh, you know, been involved with running Hulu for many years, 
that the uh, ad supported version of Hulu uh, was $5 less expensive uh, for consumers, but brought in roughly eight and a half dollars worth of monthly um, revenue just from the ad loads and the ad sales that they had. So I'm feeling pretty bullish about it. I do think that um, consumers do tend to like to pay less, even to put up with a, a small ad load. Uh, I think that both Netflix and Disney will be quite successful. We don't know how Netflix will yet price their their um, their service with ads. Disney surprised me a little bit with keeping the same price as it is today, ad free uh, for ads, and moving the ad free price up three dollars or thirty eight percent. I think that's a pretty aggressive price move. It'll be very interesting to see how much price sensitivity is in the Disney Plus subscriber ranks and see how that how that evolves. And look, you've always said Netflix and Disney can both and will both coexist, but over the longer term, given the challenges that we, we've known uh, them to face, especially over the last six months, does Netflix or Disney have the edge? They're very different services. Um, Disney is configured with the core brands of the Walt Disney Company, including, of course, Disney itself and Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, National Geographic, and it's meant, it's designed to super serve those fans, the fans of those brands. Now they have expanded under Bob Chapek, they've expanded um, the programming somewhat to have a little bit more general entertainment adult programming, but still the essence of Disney Plus is for fans of those brands, not only families, because of course if you have kids, you're more, more likely to be a fan of one of those brands, but also for adults and single people and couples, uh, many of whom are fans of, of, of those brands as well. So that's the focus of Disney Plus. And if you are a fan of one of those brands, you kind of have to have Disney Plus to satisfy uh, satisfy that affinity that you have. You can't get that programming elsewhere. So I think if you're, you know, and then Netflix, of course, is much broader based. It serves uh, uh, the entire population. It's very much a general entertainment uh, brand and, and service. So I think that has the broader footprint. And I think that Disney Plus is typically going to be an add-on to Netflix. I think both are, are doing great. I think both will be, you know, quote unquote, winners in the global battle for, um, for, for having a, a successful rollout, and they already, they already are. So I think both are going to coexist. And I don't know that either of them care if one's bigger than the other. They just want to service their consumers as best they can. Streaming, of course, has surpassed cable for uh, the first time. You know, we've, HBO's House of Dragons has been a huge hit so far. Who else uh, wins and who else loses in this new future? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, those with the best programming, I guess it's an obvious thing to say. Uh, people subscribe to these services to watch the programs that they love. I think um, you know Netflix has already been established itself as a big winner. I know there's turbulence in the stock price, and they've hit some. They've stalled out a little bit on uh, on growth of, uh, of subscribers, but I think the ad-free tier at a lower price will actually help them there. I think they should see some additional growth uh, restarting with with that offering. Um, look, I think Disney Plus and Netflix are inarguably winners. Uh, I think that HBO Max, with the programming that it has in its vault and the, and the ongoing production of HBO and Discovery uh, programming, and even CNN, which I expect to probably be in that, um, in that service, I think that's going to be a global winner. I think I've been a little bit positively surprised by Paramount Plus, to tell you the truth. I didn't have a lot of hope for it to be uh, as successful as it has been. So I think that's that's they're 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 making a big play. Then you have the Apple and you have Amazon. They have a lot of money, a lot of cash, and they have uh, other strategic reasons to be in the streaming space, other than the direct economics of those streaming uh, the streaming services themselves. So I, I think they're pretty well committed. So I think you have a handful, you know, four or five uh, global winners, and of course the niches will continue to to uh, to exist and and be profitable, but smaller. And those will be um, those will you know won't won't be competing with the big guys. But the big guys, I think there will be several of them, ultimately. I'm seeing ads for Amazon's Lord of the Rings everywhere I go, everywhere I click. Um, the reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, at least if you look at the audience reviews, not so positive uh, uh, so far. Kind of rotten on Rotten Tomatoes. Critics have been more positive. What do you make of this? Look, I haven't had a chance yet to watch it. I, I have seen the same uh, same reviews that you've seen. I would pay a lot more attention to the customer reviews than to the critic reviews. That's where the rubber meets the road, actually. But look, there's a lot of pent up uh, excitement for this for this title. I expect it to do well. Um, it doesn't have to be critically reviewed for it to be successful. Or, or and, and Rotten Tomatoes only goes so far, by the way. I just I expect it to be to work. I expect it to um, to you know to help Am Amazon continue to. Uh, gather and keep Prime subscribers. And remember, people subscribe to Prime not just for video, but primarily for delivery of their of their goods and to, and to conclude e-commerce transactions on, on, on that platform. So I do think that it's not a 
you know, a must win. It doesn't have to be one of the top shows of the year for it to be uh, to prove successful and to leverage more e-commerce activity on Amazon, which is the whole purpose of it, I think. So look, you, you know, you've also talked about consolidation, but uh, you know, it seems like you're pretty optimistic about a lot of these services. If consolidation happens, who, who gets consolidated? It's always hard to call that, Emily. Um, you know, if I knew that, I don't have a crystal ball there. But these are big <laughs> brands. I guess the ones that are you know, somewhat smaller could be consolidated. No one's consolidating Apple. No one's consolidating Amazon. That's obvious. And then you look at the media companies and which ones of those might be consolidated. There's always rumors about, you know, um, Peacock and HBO Max coming together, possibly, or the parent companies merging. Uh, Paramount and uh, Paramount Global, the parent company, is uh, all, often discussed as being in play. And Stars is out there too, by the way, which is um, being separated from Lionsgate. That that will be bought by someone ultimately, I think. So hard to say. Obviously, the bigger guys, if there is consolidation, the bigger guys swallow the smaller guys. That's the way, the physics of it, and that that will take place here too. So you might look at you might look at some of the digital giants to uh, to buy some of the uh, smaller media companies, or you might look for a merger between two media companies. But I don't. I think that that will happen ultimately, and not not in the too distant future. Now, Dan Loeb a few weeks ago uh, urging Disney to spin off ESPN was otherwise positive of Bob Chapek. Of course, you worked at Disney for so many years and oversaw ESPN. Was this ever discussed? And in your view, is this ever going to happen? Well, it's, it's a very interesting question. From time to time, we discuss you know, what, what should be the deployment of all of the assets of the Walt Disney Company. We had a very... A very uh, um, a very high quality board, and of course, one of the one of the things the board always asks of management is to review the asset portfolio that you have and, and understand whether or not there should be some additions to the assets or some subtractions. Should you sell something? So it is discussed, you know, at various times over the years that I was there. I was there for a very long time, so I had it discussed several times. Bob Chapek is a very smart guy. I respect him a lot. I think he's a great, uh, he's doing a, a very well, jo good job as CEO. He'll make the right call. My own observation would be that ESPN was a very strategic asset for the Walt Disney Company when they were, when pay TV was growing and when ESPN was such an important part of the bundle of channels that Disney had, including ABC and the Disney Channel and FX and all the different, all the different channels, National Geographic, all the channels that they have. As the pay TV universe continues its precipitous decline, I think that the channel business and also the audiences for uh, among the you know for the programming on linear channels is decreasing quite substantially. The channel business, not only for Disney but for all these media companies, is declining in, in strategic importance. So therefore, the importance of ESPN to be a, a bulwark in that channel distribution modality is becoming less. Also, so I think that the 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 reason the strategic imperative of having a sports service like ESPN is less than it used to be. So I think there is more degrees of freedom, operating flexibility, if you will, for the, for Bob and the management team there to make the right decision. So I wouldn't be shocked to see it um, spun off from Disney, but I wouldn't be shocked to see it stay there too. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, next week kicks off NFL season, and you know there's been a lot of talk about whether these streaming services need sports to take them to the next level. Is that going to drive the next chapter, the next era of subscriber growth? Maybe it's not just sports, maybe it's also news. What do you think? Well, I'm the chairman of a big sports streaming service outside the U.S. called DAZN, D-A-Z-N, and we stream the big, uh, most important soccer leagues in Italy and Spain and um, in Germany and we have and, and across the continent of Europe and in Japan. We also have a, a, big, a big presence and in the U.S. with boxing. I think that the ultimate, uh, the ultimate uh, way that sports will be delivered to consumers will be over the top. It will be delivered via the Internet, on apps, on televisions and on mobile devices just like entertainment programming is. I don't think that um, entertainment services need to have sports, nor do I think that sports needs to have entertainment. I think consumers are tired of paying a lot for sports when they're just interested in entertainment. That's what's bringing the pay TV bundle down. And I think that people just that just want to watch sports don't want to pay for entertainment necessarily. So I think the disaggregation of different programming types into and making letting consumers make a choice of what they want to pay for, I think that is the promise of the internet. That's why streaming services have, been, have done so well, and I think you'll see that here. Sports services will be paid for separately and packaged separately from entertainment in the future, I think. Would love an update on what you're doing at Candle Media. Of course, you bought Hello Sunshine. Want to know how that's going and, and where your priorities are in this new kind of constantly evolving world. 
Well, Candle Mead is doing great. They have a fantastic partner in Blackstone um, Private Equity Group. They've been unbelievable supporters of Candle. We have bought about nine or 10 companies already. The biggest ones were Hello Sunshine and a company called Moonbug. Um, Hello Sunshine is doing great. Reese, is, Reese Witherspoon is still highly involved. We have a great management team there. Um, we're, doing, we're doing very well uh, at, at Hello Sunshine, but also at Moonbug, where if you're a parent with small kids, you would, under, you would know of our great intellectual property and characters. And uh, Coca Melon, the most popular streaming, uh, the second most popular show on Netflix last year, and the second biggest YouTube channel in the world. Blippi, Little, Little Baby Bum, a whole bunch of different IP that we have at Moonbug. That's doing very well. Uh, we have bought a company called Exile, which does programming in Latin America under the stewardship of Isaac Lee, who was the former uh, head of content for both Televisa and Univision. He's a great Latin American programmer, and that's a multi-platform business that we acquired. We also acquired Attention, which does social media storytelling on TikTok and Instagram and elsewhere. That will help all of our companies do, uh, all of our brands do much better in the marketplace when they need to have a social media footprint. So we love the flywheel that we've created in traditional television content, social media storytelling, and then related commerce opportunities. And we, we're doing, we're, we're, we're very bullish on, on our future. I've got a three-year-old, Kevin. Coco Melon is huge in our house. I don't know whether to say thank you or no thank you for that, but uh, we watch a lot thank of you. it. <laughs> Kevin Meyer, uh, Candle founder and co-CEO. Always good to have you, Kevin. Have a great weekend. Thank you for stopping by. All right, a consulting firm tracking Amazon's real estate footprint says it's planning to close dozens of warehouses. Amazon has either shuttered or killed plans to open 42 facilities, totaling almost 25 million square feet of usable space. This according to MWPVL International. The company has delayed opening an additional 21 locations. CEO Andy Jassy pledged to unwind part of the pandemic era expansions. He also told me more about that at our Bloomberg Tech Summit back in June. We'll be right back. This is Bloomberg. Twitter is asking a judge to order Elon Musk to turn over all of his text messages from the first six months of 2022. The company is saying the billionaire isn't cooperating and exchanging evidence ahead of the trial in this fight over that $44 billion deal. Bloomberg's Jeff Feely joins us from Delaware. More late Friday news. Jeff, is it usual to be asking for six months of uh, text messages? I mean, should we have expected this given Elon Musk is witness number one? Yeah, I, I don't think it's an unusual request. Uh, I've seen it in other cases, and I, I suspect Mr. Musk does a lot of business uh, by text. So, you know. We'll, so, it, it is he actually going to hand them over? What's the likelihood Twitter's going to get these? Yeah, I, I think the judge will ask him to hand over, you know, maybe not all of them, but some of them. If, you know, have to go through and have somebody look at them to see if they're you know, relevant to the case, maybe, but yet he's not going to be able to keep texts completely out. How does one do this? I mean, I mean, there are hundreds, thousands of texts, and there could be a lot of different kinds of information <laughs> in those texts well, pertaining also, to other also, things that might be interesting. <laughs> true. But he also has, he, he, like many folks, he also has multiple phones and wipes his phone periodically. So, you know, it gets kind of, touchy, you know, trying to figure it out. Uh, I suspect that since he filed the notice that he was going to walk away from the deal, though, that he's been saving his texts because judges don't like hearing that that, that kind of material has been deleted. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Now, Twitter says he hasn't been cooperating in the discovery process. What does that mean? Well, in the dis discovery is the pretrial information exchange that folks do so you can, you know, get the material to put your case together. Twitter claims that he has not been cooperating in good faith, acting in good faith, dragging his feet, in other words. The, the Musk people say, oh, no, it's not us that's been dragging our feet. Twitter's been dragging their feet and trying to hide witnesses about this whole bots issue. Again, these kind of fights are very common in the run-up to these, you know, merger cases. All right, and we are still, of course, waiting to see if this uh, indeed will stay uh, in October or if it gets pushed back to November or December, as Musk is asking for. Jeff Feely in Delaware, thank you. I'm going to let you get started on your weekend. All right, we'll be right back. This is Bloomberg. Tech.
Chip stocks in focus after the U.S. government imposed new license requirements on semiconductor exports to China. Bloomberg's Ian King, of course, covers all things chips. Ian, what does this mean? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a, a big deal, first of all, for NVIDIA, obviously, $400 million in, in a quarter for NVIDIA. That certainly adds up over a year. On the flip side of that, for, for China, this is a key piece of technology. These are key AI accelerators that really help train these systems. So if you're a, in a hyperscaler, you really need this if you want to stay up with what Google, what AWS are doing. And that's really, you know, could be a major blow to some of these Chinese customers. You know, chip companies reporting, it's been a lot of doom and gloom, but Broadcom seems to be more positive. Why is that? Yeah, no, I mean, they, they spent an hour on the phone yesterday with analysts saying, are you sure, you know, answering the same question, which was, are you sure, are you sure? And, you know, it's really a division between the PC-related companies where we've seen, you know, laptop demand has just gone away after the pandemic and, you know, lots of companies like Intel, like AMD, are, you know, a lot weaker outlook. On the flip side, Broadcom is saying, look, infrastructure, these giant data centers, people are still building. Companies are still investing in their infrastructure, and that's why our numbers are good. Broadcom is, of course, a big Apple supplier. What is what they had to say indicate about iPhone demand, especially with the big Apple event coming up next week? Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. That got kind of lost in the, in the general mix yesterday. And what Broadcom said was like, you know, the, the shipments for our large North American customer that everybody knows who it is, it's, it's, it's Apple, um, are going to be kind of what they were last at this point last time and, and demand is solid so the indications at least from that on a unit basis is that apple is expecting the, the next version of the iphone to be sort of as good as the previous one was which i think given you know the environment and consumer spending would be seen as a positive sign all right and of course bloomberg technology will be coming to you live from the apple event uh wednesday of next week will be across all of those new iPhones we're expecting them to unveil. Bloomberg's Ian King. Ian, thank you so much for that update. Coming up, education in the metaverse. It may not be as far out as you think. We're going to talk about what it means for student data privacy and more next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. For the last installment of our EdTech series this week, we want to take a look at education in the metaverse. With today's technology already prompting so many safety concerns, how do we make sure the metaverse can be a safe place for all students? Let's bring in Kathy hirsch pasek for more on this. She's a professor of psychology at Temple University and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, Dr. hirsch pasek thank you so much for joining us. What does the metaverse look like in the classroom? Or should I say, what does the classroom look like in the metaverse? Well, we're not really sure yet is the true <laughs> answer to that. We're on the cusp of so much that's so exciting that it feels kind of like the dot-com revolution. And I think many of us are trying to figure it out. But I want to take you on a journey right now of what it would be like if instead of reading paragraphs about ancient Greece, you actually got to visit it. And you actually got to figure out how we know so much about ancient Greece, given that we're living thousands of years later. So what if students could be active and engaged as they were learning, as opposed to passive when they're reading or listening? You know, it, it, it's, I, I feel like technology is just coming into classrooms. We're just getting kids to start learning how to code. How are we going to get educators and schools on board and equipped with this new technology, even when it is available? Well, I think it's going to take a little while, to be quite honest with you. The affordability is a big piece, as you mentioned. Um, the second big piece is right now the glasses are kind of clunky, but um, researchers are working on that. Technology folks are working on it. So quite soon, I think it's going to be like 
wearing a pair of glasses like this. And we're going to be able to <laughs> enter into new spaces and alternate realities. One key piece I want to add here, though, is that this is not meant to be a substitute for the kind of reality that we live in or for the social interactions we have in that reality. It's not a solo game. This is meant to be a space in which we can work with others and have teachers who guide us into these worlds and back again. A lot of parents, including myself, are concerned about screen time, concerned about tech addiction. Why wouldn't this make all of that worse? <laughs> well, look, tech has its good sides and its bad sides. It takes us to places that we could never go otherwise. On the other hand, if we sit around by ourselves just investigating tech, we found out that the solo doesn't work so well for human beings because we have a socially integrated brain and that's how we learn. So I think what we need to move to are more collective kinds of environments that prop, prompt social interaction rather than taking over for it. They can't be substitutes. And that's going to be true as we go along. It's the same as nutrition. Um, how are we going to stop our kids from eating dessert? Well, we have to set limits and say, you know, you got to eat the broccoli. <laughs> now, what about uh, concerns about privacy and protecting our, our children in these new worlds, given that much of this uh, technology is going to be deployed by big tech companies, some of which don't have the best records on privacy? Boy, isn't that, isn't that true? I think at the beginning, um, you know, it would be wonderful if a lot of this were through the gating of education systems so that teachers would work together to pick wonderful experiences that our kids could learn from and enjoy and that they could be guides in. Um, what I don't think we want to create is something that's a total free-for-all because I worry like you do that uh, many of these new technologies can get out of hand. So let's move slowly this time and let's try to think it out before we just thrust it in the marketplace. I spoke with the Attorney General of New Mexico yesterday, Hector Balderas, who's sounded the alarm about kids' privacy when it comes to technology in the current world. He's actually sued yes. Google uh, about how they used student data even, even before the pandemic uh, ever happened because you know, a lot of the technology that schools are using, it's free software, free technology, um, because a lot of these schools are under-resourced. He's very concerned about regulation and whether or not lawmakers can figure out how to regulate current technologies. Take a listen to what he had to say. I think technology is a great equalizer in terms of education outcomes, but we are not regulating these companies and we are not regulating safety and these safeguards within these technology products. What do you think about Dr. Hirsch? that Dr. Hirsch Pasek, given that, you know, obviously we want everyone to have the benefit of these technologies, but they also need to be fairly and appropriately regulated. But regulation is up to lawmakers who don't necessarily understand the technology that they're trying to regulate. Well, I think we're going to have to help train them. And I think it's really important. I couldn't agree more with what I just heard. I think there has to be some regulation to make this safe for parents and for children. And I think we have to deal with that up front. In the same way, we have to make sure that there's quality, quality experiences in the metaverse. Again, as I suggested to you, we have to have some gatekeeping. And a free-for-all that just says anything goes is dangerous for children. And as a parent, I would be scared too. I'm with you. Hmm. Then there's the equity piece. And, you know, so oh, much yes. of tech and classrooms. Oh, yes. Right, like so much of tech in classrooms is not equitable. Some students yeah. have access to these things, some students don't. If you don't have access, there can be these huge learning gaps. I mean, when it comes to something like the metaverse and technology that's you know so advanced, are you concerned this could, could lead to even more, even bigger sort of class divides in education? Well, as we suggested in our paper, this is something we definitely have to have to look at. Look, we're on the cusp of something, and the classrooms aren't really ready, nor the schools yet, for taking on the metaverse. So I think we have some lead time here 
to really think about how we want to introduce it. What should the school classroom look like? How should we retrain in teaching, uh, teaching professional development? How do the teachers get on board so they help us in the training? How do we bring scientists in? So what we're presenting on the metaverse really is of high quality for children. Now, in the interim, it may be something like an IMAX, and it may be that communities will adopt a certain place where schools can take their kids on field trips and visit areas they could have never visited otherwise. So I think there's tremendous potential. And while I appreciate that um, your concentration today is more on the risks and the safety and the oh no's, I think we have to put together the oh no's and the oh my goshes and see if we can create an optimal product that will be safe for children and will bring everyone in at a cost that will be reasonable. So let's uh, leave then on the oh my goshes. What uh, are you most excited about and where do you think we will realistically be, let's say five years from now? I think five years from now, we will have more affordable products that allow us to visit the metaverse. I don't think classrooms will be quite ready yet, but I do think we could set up community centers that people could take field trips in. And I think the, oh my gosh, for me, is that a lot of things that were otherwise kind of boring to learn for kids might then be excited. And if we can bring more joy and more experience and more energy into classrooms and into learning experiences, children will not only learn what we're teaching them, but they will learn how to learn. And since the world is changing so, so very quickly, that's a skill that everyone needs. Well, that is something certainly worth continuing to innovate for. Uh, Kathy Hirsch Pasek, professor of psychology at Temple University and uh, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Thank you. Uh, what a fascinating conversation. Appreciate you stopping by. Okay, coming up. What Congress wants to know about crypto fraud from the biggest exchanges. That's next. This is Bloomberg. hedge fund that sold most of its crypto holdings last month says today's jobs report could have been dire for the price of Bitcoin. AlphaTrade CEO Max Gockham saying Bitcoin could have dropped below $15,000 or to $15,000 if the report was a major beat. He notes Bitcoin has been increasingly tied to macro sentiment. Joining us to discuss, Juthika Cho, head of OTC trading for Kraken. Uh, Juthika, what's your take on this? I mean, I think there's no question that Bitcoin has been tied to the macro markets. Um, and I think that's for a few reasons. So, you know, in one area, Bitcoin is kind of like a growth tech stock, you know, a 300, 400 billion dollar market cap. It's not really a macro asset. It does trade like a growth stock. You can think about it kind of like an equity investment, um, but that's a small component. I think another piece is that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, similar to signals like technical analysis, sometimes if everybody's looking at them and kind of trading on them and believing them, you can start to see that price action. Um, and then I think the, the last piece is that uh, in a lot of ways, I think investors in the crypto space are latching on to the macro narrative a little bit because without that, there wouldn't really be many catalysts or many events for Bitcoin. You know, we're in a bear market. Volatility has come down. We've been sitting around 20,000 for a while. And so if not for some of these macro events like Jackson Hole and some of the jobs numbers, um, August would look a lot quieter. And so crypto investors are following them, um, I think, for the, a number of those reasons. Well, speaking of events, we've got the merge coming up in mid-September. You know, what are you expecting uh, to happen around the merge? What kind of volume will there be? Will there be a sort of sell the news event? 
Well, we're definitely seeing a wide range of speculative uh, bets and positioning and hedging that are being put on, particularly in the derivatives market and in the options market. Um, Ethereum open interest is reaching highs. We're seeing a lot of volume through our OTC desk on Ethereum. And so I think investors are gearing up for something to happen. Um, I think if you look at the volatility surface or the, the term structure, uh, the September 16th term, which is the one that's kind of pricing in at least a couple of the merge events, uh, is about 10 points over the September 9th term. And so I think investors are gearing up for some sort of price action and some sort of move for sure. What about Kraken? How's Kraken handling the merge? Are you going to halt trading of Ether, for example? We won't halt trading. Nope. So uh, customers can still trade Ether. It'll be available. They can trade at OTC. Um, all the trading services will be available. Uh, there might be temporary suspension on withdrawals and deposits, uh, just at the blockchain level. But uh, trading will still be available. Congress has been questioning Kraken about your handling of fraud. What is it important that regulators know about your security standards? Well, you know, Kraken abides by all the necessary KYC and transaction monitoring. And this obviously isn't my area of expertise, but we've been doing this for many years. Kraken itself has been around for more than a decade. And you can't be around for more than a decade in the crypto space unless you're abiding by all the local regulations. And so um, I think some of the inquiries might be related to just some of the fallout unrelated to, to Kraken, really, from 3AC and Tornado and things of that nature. Um, but from our point of view, this is just kind of standard KYC transaction monitoring that we normally do. Meantime, Crypto.com, the story getting a lot of attention, is suing a woman after accidentally sending her $7 million. She was supposed to get 100 and, and, and reportedly she went on a little bit of a spending spree. I'm so curious what your reaction is to this story and, and how Kraken handles these kinds of scenarios and avoids these kinds of errors. Well, you know, I think this is one of those things with that when you look at Bitcoin and what makes it so powerful is that this transaction settlement finality that, you know, without any intermediary, you can send money 24-7, 365, and it's a gross settlement network that, you know, clears instantly, like better than wire transfers. But obviously there is this downside that you have to be really careful. Um, Kraken, you can, again, imagine being around for many, many years, has a lot of protections, policies, procedures, safeguards. Um, anytime funds are, are sent out, we have a host of customer service representatives that assist in it too. Um, and we do a proof of reserves audit so that customers can also feel comfortable that all of the funds that they have on deposit are, um, are not being sent out either for nefarious reasons or for errors. So all of these things have really been built over time because all of the powerful elements you get from being able to send money, you know, Bitcoin as a method of payment on a blockchain come with some downsides too. And so we have to protect against those for sure. So speaking of the downsides, where do you think the bottom is? Well, you know, I, I do think it depends on the macro environment. I mean, within crypto, I think with volatility coming down, you can kind of see that investors have gotten a little bit comfortable around this level, which can be both a good and a bad thing. A lot of the panic and the leverage has been wiped out of the system. So there's not as much of that um, inherent kind of riskiness that's still in a lot of the positions that are out there. But I think everybody's waiting to see what happens with the macro markets. And once there's a little bit of resilience shown in the NASDAQ and the S&P, then I think we'll see that filter into crypto markets as well. All right. Thanks for that. Kraken, head of OTC Trading, Juthika Chow. Appreciate you stopping by. What would you buy with $7 million if it accidentally showed up in your bank account? It's fun to think about, right? Okay, coming up, how Elizabeth Holmes tried to get her fraud conviction thrown out and why it didn't work out. That's next. Joel Rosenblatt, who was in the courtroom when that decision was handed down, is next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get back to the Theranos trial. A lot has happened since Elizabeth Holmes' guilty verdict. For one, she just tried to get her own fraud conviction thrown out. But 
The judge upheld that verdict. Let's break it all down with our court reporter, Joel Rosenblatt, who was in the courtroom every day and was there for this latest decision. So what happened? So yesterday's hearing was a rather routine hearing in which Elizabeth Holmes and her lawyers argued that the verdict should be set aside or thrown out for insufficient evidence so that the government really just didn't uh, uh, amass or marshal the evidence required to convict her on, on the various counts that she was convicted of. Mm -hmm. um, that was quickly dismissed uh, and kind of surprisingly for this judge who likes to weigh and consider everything, mm -hmm. he uh, wasn't having it really. Mm -hmm. So um, what's next? I mean, does she have any other options? She does, and so well, there's a so we're entering the end game of her legal odyssey. But there's going to be a flurry of activity now. So we have left her sentencing next month, uh, and assuming that goes well for the prosecution, um, she will show up for prison 60 to 90 days after that. However, yesterday at this hearing, she, in true kind of Holmes fashion, threw something of a curveball, hinted at a curveball, and this is a, a different kind of motion in which she's arguing for a new trial. Hmm. So her attorneys have found something since, uh, since the conviction that they've decided that, they've, that they're going to argue uh, warrants a, a whole new trial. So not, not an acquittal, as they argued for yesterday and looks like they failed, but for a whole new trial. Just three more months for Joel Rosenblatt in the courtroom, is that what that means? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well, yeah. Really though, well, how likely is it that she's gonna get a new trial? All of this is unlikely. Yesterday's, ch the chances of yesterday's acquittal, the acquittal she asked for, very low probability, I mean mm -hmm. extremely low. Uh, all white collar criminal defendants or convicts usually ask for this but don't get it. This new, this new uh, question of, of, of a new trial based on this new evidence, again, low probability. But it's just kind of so fitting with how this thing has unfolded. And it's just going to be interesting to see what, what it is that she comes up with. So in all likelihood, she's going to jail. In all likelihood, she's going to prison. I'm just like, it's just kind of unbelievable after all this time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm being careful. How much time is she likely to serve when so, all is said and done? So this is the question I always get because people always want to know. And look. There has been a, a case made that her entire defense was built around not winning an acquittal, but minimizing her, her time served. Mm. If she gets seven years, mm -hmm. seven years, that would be a win for her. Really? At this point, that would be a win. She's facing, uh, well, legally 20 years. She's likely to get eight to 10 years. Okay. And at what point, how much longer does this drag on? Her sentencing is scheduled for uh, October 17th. If, uh, you know, barring, these, barring a kind of uh, twist that we've discussed, um, she would be asked to show up for prison 60 to 90 days after that sentencing. Uh, and she will appeal, but it's unlikely that she would have to be, she would have to go to prison mm -hmm. while she appeals her conviction. And what's happening with Sunny Balwani? So case. Sonny, meanwhile, yeah, everybody kind of has <laughs> forgotten about Sonny. Um, <laughs> but uh, he was convicted in May on 12 counts. And, uh, so in other words, so all the counts, uh, including the, the, the uh, counts of patient fraud, um, his sentencing is scheduled for November. Will he serve as much time as her? Will he serve more time than her? What decides that? Very interesting. This, this kind of this end game, this phase of sentencing, right? Both sides will make the case that these are, in fact, good people who maybe went astray. All these kinds of arguments from family members and friends. And the judge will decide and he will compare their respective roles in this fraud and decide who should get what. They were both convicted of conspiracy. It was a conspiracy. Uh, it was a crime of co-conspirators, mm -hmm. so I th I'm thinking they're going to get the same sentence. I think they're both going to be serving eight to ten years. All right. Uh, Joel Ro Rosenblatt, who, of course, has lived and breathed uh, both of these cases. Thank you, Joel, for that update. Appreciate it. All right. This weekend, NASA will try again Saturday to launch its Artemis 1 moon rocket. The space agency tried earlier this week, but the launch was scrubbed because of a problem with one of the rocket's engines and other technical issues. It is the first major flight in NASA's ambitious plan to go back to the moon. This mission is carrying test dummies instead of astronauts. You can watch the launch Saturday on Bloomberg Television. Coverage starts 2 p.m. Eastern.
And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Tuesday, we're going to start a series on sports technology. That'll be a fun one. DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins will help us kick that off. Have a great weekend, everyone. This is Bloomberg.